Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the projects that I maintain and kind of their current status. So, next slide, please. Gotcha is an old screen capture utility that's been around for years um, that I took over maintaining mainly because it's going to go into Arkanoa as the utility that captures the screen using the print screen key and alternative keys. Um, Gotcha runs completely in the background. There's no, or Gotcha Quiet runs completely in the background. There's no indication that it's running at all on anything, except you can find it and kill utilities. Um, but if you hit print screen, it will capture to file in whatever way you, your settings are, either your screen or a window or a screen region, and again, that all is dependent on what you have done for settings. And you can call up the settings dialog with alt print screen, control print screen captures. You can go on to the next slide. Control print screen will capture it to clipboard so you can paste it someplace else. I've even added a command line switch so that if you really want the actual PM behavior, which is to print the screen directly to the printer, you can put the command line switch on and it'll do that. And then shift print screen will still print it to file. So it's just a modern way to get print screen. For anybody who use, is, has used Gotcha, the regular program which you just pull up on the screen and use to manually capture is also included. And I've made some various fixes to it. Next slide. Yeah. Do you have the facility to catch the mouse? There's no getting in the screenshot. You should be able to because there's the facility to delay the capture. So what happens is you can set it up to capture, then you can put the mouse cursor someplace that you want it, and it should capture it. Because in all previous versions, gotcha, it never caught the mouse. I'd have to. I'd have to look at it. I. That was one of the reasons I use uh, PM camera mm -hmm. because that can catch the mouse. I'll I'll take a look at that. I I just offhand don't remember. I think it does, but I I just don't recall with certainty. I know you by using the delay you can open a menu. You can open up the menu on the window so that when it gets captured the menu will be open. Um, <clears throat> these are a handful of the changes from the old gotcha is obviously Gotcha Quiet is a completely new program. You did have the option of a quiet on it, but it had some problems. One of the things is it couldn't capture with the print screen keys if you were over a VIO window. That's because PM and its infinite, or OS2 and its infinite wisdom sends a different key code if you're over a VIO window. But since I now know what that key code is, I capture it. Um, <clears throat> I switched from using MMOS2. From using MMOS2 to, to generate the images to using the generalized bitmap module, um, <clears throat> which works a lot better and it allows for capture of JPEGs and pings, so you can capture much smaller sized files. The old bitmaps were huge, and of course most people are going to want to be capturing a screen because they want to send it somewhere to show somebody something. 
So that's a big advantage. <clears throat> and then I just reworked the appearances of it. As part of doing this, I even got to rewrite the Whatcom resource compiler, which didn't take one of the key words that had been used in the development of this. So nothing's ever easy or straightforward. I also do L switcher. Um, it's a task switcher. It's both, you can have a freestanding bar or you can use it as an X workplace widget. Um, if you use it as an X workplace widget, it replaces the task windows widget. Um, <clears throat> You have a lot of formatting -ish options. You can group all of a given type of program. Like if I have six different 4OS2 shells open, they're all stacked on top of each other and I can just click on it and pick the one that I want off of that list so that I don't end up with this bar that goes on forever. And I can also do it with icons where there is no title beside it. In other words, instead of saying 4OS2, it's just the icon of, of, OS2, of 4OS2. <clears throat> you can set the priorities on the programs from a menu. Just left click on them and you can pull up it'll, and you can then set their priority. <clears throat> you can um, obviously switch between them cascade, anything, pretty much anything the PM switcher will do. There is also a pop-up which is either Alt or Control Escape. It's Alt by default, Alt Escape, which pulls up a pop-up on the screen where you can do all of these same things if you don't want to use the taskbar. Next slide. <coughs> I have the release version on a thumb drive in my pocket, which hasn't been released yet, but I will release it in the next couple of days. I'm actually waiting for someone to send me the Spanish translation, but I'm not sure I'm ever going to get it. <coughs> okay, things that have changed is the bar can be set to automatically hide, and I've now made it so that the user can set how long they want the bar to stay up before it hides. You just put the mouse up over the bar and it'll reappear. I also limited the activation area. You can adjust the length of the bar if you want. You can have it less than the entire length of the screen. But historically, even when it was less than the length of the screen, it would activate any place on this side that it was on. I've now restricted it so you have to actually get over the bar so that the upper right hand corner of the screen is free so that you could use it for something off a of pager so they wouldn't interfere with each other. <clears throat> I've made it locale aware so it now sets its own language and it installs the correct language. Unfortunately, there's only two languages, basically English and Spanish. There is German. There's German for all the menu items and everything like that. There's just no German help. <clears throat> and of course, when the newest X Workplace came out, um, L switchers started trapping. Don't know whose fault that was, but I'm the one that ended up fixing it. So once you get it, 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 it's not a problem anymore. And it was only a problem if you had grouped icons. And the latest X Workplace, which I don't think has actually been released, has added the new widget menu item everywhere. So you don't have to try to get your pointer over just right on one of those dividers, which is a big hassle. You can now just do it anywhere. The problem is, is that the widgets, for, to work with some of the widgets, they had to be rewritten to, to add the menu item, and I've added the menu item so that 
that will work over Hell's Witcher. And of course it works with all the widgets that come with X Workplace because when they added the new widget item, they added it to all of their widgets. So something makes life a little easier. Next slide. <clears throat> Lucid, though probably nobody knows that it was released four days ago and is up on NetLabs. Lucid 5.0, 1.5.0. <clears throat> I did announce it at the OS2 World, but Martin hasn't gotten around to putting the announcement up, or at least he hadn't the last time I looked. Um, <clears throat> um, so if you're interested in it, it is out on NetLab's incoming. Um, <clears throat> the thing that we were looking at here is this was this has been released to fix a long-standing bug that basically what had happened is Poplar, which is the underlying PDF engine. Um, apparently the Linux guys don't care how many mutex handles they use, but we unfortunately are limited to 64,000. And on large file on large files it poplar would exhaust them and it would hang um so it was kind of an interesting problem and you know how many you know how many mutex handles it required to do this one well no they were just generating a new handle every time they did anything instead of reusing the same handle <laughs> so yeah, they weren't cleaning up anything. <laughs> so, Lucid, I updated Poplar, obviously, and fixed that. And of course, once I did that, it broke Lucid again, because it created a, um, an exception, which was a floating point underflow, which basically, if you're building with GCC, which is what Lucid is, you're supposed to mask it because it doesn't care that you have a floating point underflow. So, so I got to go back and fix that as my reward for fixing the, uh, the Poplar issue because there was no reason to fix the Poplar issue in the Poplar that we were using because the latest Poplar was 15 generations later than the one we were using. And there, there is still about eight more over Poplar 059. The reason that we're using that Poplar is because in the one following it, they dropped QT4 support, so they would not have been able to, a QPDF view would not have worked. So this was the compromise, was to take it to the last one that had QT4 support. <laughs> so. Basically, the moral of the story is nothing on OS2 is straightforward. <clears throat> um, also have, next slide. I have a question. Sure. This is part of the Unix prior ports uh, section, isn't it? Poplar? On, on, on that laps, or? Because you mentioned. Poplar is, yeah. Because you mentioned uh, the uh, maintainer is not getting any fee or something. Well, it's maintained by Bitwise, or? It's maintained by Bitwise. But I'm talking about me. I don't get anything for, for maintaining these. And if you like my software, do me a favor if you're using it. Make a donation to Bitwise. Because QT5 is a lot more important to me than somebody sending me a few dollars. <clears throat> um, See. So we did update the the Poplar. Um, it also was interesting. If you didn't have a printer installed and opened the printer dialog, Lucid would drop. So I fixed it. It just doesn't open the printer dialog anymore if there's no printer. Um, <clears throat> I also what I had seven bugs for people who wanted to be able to save a file. Because Poplar does not do save. 
it will only do save as. Which, of course, if you have a fill-in form, doesn't make a lot of sense. So I fixed that in Lucide. And, of course, it was a giant kludge because what I do is a double save as <laughs> to do it. But um, it now works that you can just, from your standpoint, it's transparent. It just saves. Um, <clears throat> I made this installer localware also, or let's put it this way, I returned it to being local aware because 135 was and 140 wasn't. Well, someone else did the warp in for 140, and I went back to the original one. <clears throat> uh, there's now a context menu. In other words, you can right mouse click over the window and it'll pull up uh, the options of copying and saving and things like that and there wasn't previously that also if you hold the mouse pointer over a link it will actually show you what the url is for that link so you actually will know where it's taking you and obviously that's for external links for links within the document, it doesn't. But for all the external links, that way you can know what website it's going to take you to before you go. And like I said, it's actually up on NetLabs right now. And it has a sizable collection of dependencies. So I really recommend that you use RPM to install, not it, because it's a warp in, but to install its dependencies. Because the big problem, while well, I have the list of its dependencies, and I think there's six of them, I don't have a list of the dependencies of those dependencies, which is the real problem. And I know there have been several people who have tried to manually install it who could never get it working. And it wasn't because of the top line dependencies, it was because of the ones underneath it. So while I'm sure that a lot of you, like me, are not entirely thrilled with RPM, it's really better than any other alternative that we have at this point because we don't have enough developers to replace all those libraries that we're getting from Linux in some other fashion. <clears throat> Next slide. And I too do an editor. I do EFTE, which is a programming editor. Um, so it's got, I think, highlighting for 40 different formats, somewhere in that range. Um, and it's got a collection of programming tools that have been automated, which are some of which are listed there. And a folding text editor, all that means is that I can put marks. It will automatically fold at the at the functions. In other words, just folds up so you have just the list of functions and then you can open one individually. Makes it easier to find things because I can fold it at any arbitrary consistent point if I wish to. <clears throat> and this one will probably be released as week two. Um, these are, go ahead, next slide, sorry. These are a list of changes. Um, I've added list file creation, which what that means is I can just add to it to the, I've got it set up for Watcom. I can just add to the Watcom command line to create a list file, the name of the object file. It will then open, it will then create the list file and open it for me. So it just saves me a little time and effort. And probably tells you something about my programming that I have to make enough list, list files often enough that, uh, that I would bother to do that. <clears throat> um, the configure files, I don't know if anybody's used FTE, which is the actual original program to this, um, which was then forked to EFTE, which was mostly de developed for Linux. Uh, the major difference between them is you would have to pre for FTE, the configuration files had to be pre-compiled. There was a separate program where you would compile 
a group of text files into the configuration files. And so if you wanted to change them, you of course had to go out and change them and then go in and recompile it and stuff like that. EFT does that on the fly. In other words, it just has those text files out there and it, can t it compiles them when it's opened. So in the original one, you could use relative path names to link the files together. In EFT, you couldn't. And I've now fixed that so you can again use relative path names to link the files together. Um, regular expression searches were broken in it. And what was interesting is it couldn't find blank lines. <coughs> so that's been fixed. Uh, the other thing was is if you closed using the close menu item, it would save its history. If you use the X up in the corner or the sys menu close, it wouldn't. And that I also fixed. And I'm sure I broke some other platform by doing that because I changed the return code arbitrarily in the spot. So it probably does, probably if I rebuilt it for Linux, it probably wouldn't run, or at least it wouldn't close. <laughs> um, the, I don't know if any of you use it, where you push down the mouse button three and then drag and it will scroll a file. That now works in this. Um, try it in E, it works fine there. The line lengths had been set arbitrarily, to I think it was 1,024. And on some of the files that I was looking at, especially command line logs for some of the compile orders, it would truncate the file length. So I lengthened them to 496. Hopefully, I'll never have to make them longer than that. <clears throat> I put in kbuild. Since Lucid uses kbuild, I put in kbuild um, highlighting. And it fixed several traps that, well, no one had reported them to me, but I get them. <coughs> Next, I also maintain F FM2. Haven't done much with it in a long time, but might be persuaded to if someone is interested in having something done. Next slide. FM2 is a file manager. Um, it has, it can perform all the basic file functions that you can think of, copy, move, all those types of things. And it has a multitude of ways that you can perform these various things. So it's pretty easy to adapt it to whatever you want it to be. There's a couple of, um, compare is an, is an example of one of the places where you can go out and pick whatever file you use. I know there's a couple of um, Linux file comparers that are Qt based that you can actually make those your compare tools so you can pick the files and pull it up and it will just open that as if it's part of it. Um, there's several other places all of the editors can be changed to whatever your favorite tool is, the viewers, all of those types of things. Next slide. One of the nice things that I found out that it did, and interestingly, this I first realized that it could do this about 15 years after I started using it. <coughs> it creates objects. I can just go out if I want to install a program that doesn't have an installer, I can simply go out and pick that program and then I can create an object or a shadow and I can tell it exactly where to put it. I fixed it not probably five years ago now so that it would create Java objects. And what, what that means is if you pick a jar file as the thing you're going to make an object for, it sets up your Java executable makes the jar file the, uh, the basically the command line. And so for straightforward, simple Java objects, it makes them automatically and they work automatically. I have it reset the desktop because I found an interesting thing. 
if you go in and edit it before the desktop has been reset, which basically is before the any file has been saved, it loses the icon. Because you can also, it also allows you to pick an icon for the program. Because obviously the icon for a jar file isn't going to, under OS2, automatically match up with that jar file. So you can pick the icon. It, you can pick the Java executable you want to use also. It defaults to the open six, but you can change that. And so with that, it, that's, it's kind of a nice feature. If you want to create a Java object, you can do it in one step. Next, next slide. It's got several different viewers. It's got a viewer, an editor. You can put in a binary editor, <coughs> which is whatever program you'd like to do. Um, the viewers also, when, they, when you open something, if it has emails in it or if it has URLs in it, you can directly link. You can click on those and they'll open whatever your default browser or email program is with that address. Uh, <coughs> it has a basic media player. My advice probably at this point is don't use it, but it will play things that have, that have MMOS2 um, codexes for it. Uh, JPEGs don't open because, interestingly, MMOS2 is set up so that you're supposed to be able to query it and query the plugins, and the plugin is supposed to come back and tell you, okay, I can do this. Well, the JPEG plugin doesn't tell you anything. And there was actually MP3 plugin. It would open EXE files. It told you it could open anything. That one I actually fixed, but... Uh, All these can be configured, I guess, so you can put yeah. your own tools in there. Right. You can, you can select the tools you want. The, 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 the media player can't. It's, you're stuck with MMOS2. You can't change that. But almost everything else you can change. Like my editor is EFTE in my FM2. Next slide. Um, FM2, you can set associations. In other words, just like you set associations in PM. And the advantage to that, well, I can give you an example. The, the Warpin viewer, can't think of what its name is, but it'll actually pull it up and you can look through and see what files are in it, in the Warpin and stuff like that, is my association with FM2. Because I will use it when I'm building a Warpin to go in and make sure all the files are actually in it and things like that. And then I can hit the control key and double click on it and it actually opens it and warp it. So I can use two different programs to look at the same set of files depending on the circumstances under which I want to use it. So that's why there's a second set of associations that are in FM2. You also can make stock commands. Um, I put in build level, for example. I can click on a file and pick build level and it'll pull up and show me the build level of whatever file I've selected. You can, you know, and you can pretty much any command that you could do from command line, you could add in there. So, and you can, you can have commands that take a file as its argument or you can put in a command that doesn't require a file and it just will open that. Um, Smart SVN, I have a, have a command in that opens Smart SVN for me, but it doesn't open a file per se. So you have all kinds of different ones. And you can, make, you can put those onto a toolbar. You can add commands to the toolbar. You create the command, you pick an icon to go with it, or you don't even have to because you can just have a button that has its name on it if that's all you want, if you don't want to bother with the icon. And then you can create a new button and that will run that command for you. So it's quite versatile in that regard. <coughs> Next. Next slide. <coughs> okay, it can view archives. 
right now there are 12 different formats of archive that are supported. Um, <clears throat> TAR is a moving target because they keep changing the format inside of it, but that's <laughs> a different story. And of, with those 12, there's 33 different versions because, like I said, TAR, they keep changing the order in which the fields are in it. And so I've got one for four different TAR versions, all of which aren't quite the same. And so if you know what version of TAR you're using, you know which one to pick. <coughs> um, they will create the archives. Obviously, it has no archivers in it at all. The archivers you have to have as their executable somewhere in your path. Or you can put the full path name in when you, when you set them up. To, to do this, but that's all it does is it just calls them with the appropriate formatting string for what you want. It has an any file viewer and you can do also view at regular and extended attributes. Um, you can edit some attributes, basically text attributes. You can't uh, edit any of the binary formats. And the asterisks are because those have a standalone version. In other words, if all I want to do is look at archives or if I want to associate a program to be my archive viewer, I can associate the archive program within FM2 and not have to open this whole monolithic program just to look at an archive. Next slide. Um, it has the capacity to compare directories. You can just feed two directories in it and it'll pull the listings up side by side, tell you which file's older, which file's newer, which one's larger, smaller, which match exactly, all the types of things that you'd want to do. And then you can sync them by simply selecting them by attribute. In other words, if you want all of the newer files, you can just select newer, it'll select all the newer, and then you can just, once they're selected, you can just copy them over to the other directory. So, see all files, I don't really use much because with the size of today's hard drives, this is a huge monolithic, endless list of file names. So, you know, a, a dialog box with 100,000 files in it is not very useful. <laughs> so that one was probably quite useful when it was developed back in the early 90s. Not so much anymore. But the find, the seek and scan files is pretty good. You can add text in for it to search for. And you can basically, from a file dialog, pick whatever tree you want it to search in. In other words, I can search all my drives, including all my network drives, at the one end and down to a single, sub down to a single directory at the other end, depending on how fine or how coarse my search needs to be. Um, you can say most of these things, if you do something regularly, if you do the same search, if you do any of those things, you can save them so that rather than have to type them in again, you can just click on them and they'll run them. And, and it will also find duplicates based on a couple different criteria. Um, next slide. <coughs> The file collector is a place that you can, you could do multiple searches and keep all of the stuff in that collector. You can, that way you have them where you can manipulate them. You can copy them from there. You can rename them from there. You can do all of these functions without having to go out and actually find the directory they're really in. 
so it makes it a lot more convenient to get to a lot of these. Uh, another feature that I really don't use much is the I, INF um, help bookshelf viewers. Basically what it does is it just pulls up all the help files or I, IPF files that are in your paths so that you can again pick them off a list. So if you're, it's a way to find your help manuals pretty quickly. Um, you can also select a group of files or a single file and then you can save that single file or list to the clipboard. You can save it with the paths, without the paths, for the names. So it's an easy, it's an easy way if you want to tell somebody to get such and such file and you don't want to type out the name of the file, you can just select it onto the clipboard and, and paste it in anywhere. It also creates what are called list files and in that list file, I can basically, anything that it shows, in other words, by that I mean in a details view, the size, the EA size, the creation dates, all of that information, I, in that list file, can have all of that or as little of that as I want. In other words, if I just wanted the list of file names, I can limit it to just the list of file names. But again, it's a convenient way of getting the information to tell somebody, well, this is, this is the version of this I have and this is what's with it. Next slide. <clears throat> it's got some other interesting things. It has a directory size function, which what it'll do is it'll run through the entire drive. It will tell you how much of the drive is full and then it'll tell you how much of that is in any given directory which is really nice when you've got a drive that's almost full and you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I get something off this drive? And pretty soon you pull up and at, 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 at the top is the directory temp never use garbage, which is two thirds of the drive. <coughs> so it is pretty um, useful. And vtree and vdirectory are kind of standalone FM2 things. This is more like the drives folder. All vTree has is just the, the drives tree. And, but if I click on it, I can open a directory container just like you would in the drives folder. So it works very much like the drives folder. Um, next slide. Okay, you can configure it for different tasks. There's a thing called states, which what that is, is let's say, well, I, when I do development, I usually have one to open to wherever my build products end up and another one open to the directory I'm going to copy them to to test that build product. And so what I will do is I save that as a state. So if I go in and I'm going to do um, L switcher, all I do is go up and under my states, I pick L switcher and it sets up all of my, all of my containers to exactly where I want them to facilitate my building or working on L switcher. So it, it's, it's quite a nice feature to be able to quickly get back to wherever you were and then and not then be locked into every time you think about changing to a different directory for some other reason thinking oh god now i'm going to have to get back to this because i can just go back up and punch the states again um for fm2 it takes on its command line various things uh, it takes an any file name so all the settings obviously are in the any file so if I have two distinctly different ways that I want to use FM2, I can set up the first one with its regular any file, and then I can set up a second, then I can open a second one with a different any file name. It'll create that any file name, and I can do whatever settings I want in that which are different from the first one. Then I can make two objects, and each of the objects all I have to do is have that minus x 
fall, min that's minus that path. That's the path name. And, <clears throat> and it is, I then can pick whichever one of those I want for the purpose I want and have the different settings. Like in one of them I could have EFTE as my editor and in the other one I could have QE as my editor. And I would have those two distinct ones. The same thing you can do with the command and the custom tool. What are called toolboxes? They're called toolboxes in FM2. That's what was in the help when I got it. But they're really the toolbars. Um, then there's an FM2 light, which is a stock configuration. It opens the tree and two directory containers. And that's the way it always is. In FM2, I could have a tree in one directory container. I could have the tree in four directory containers. I could rearrange the directory containers any way I wanted. In FM2 light, I can't do that. Basically, all it is is a stripped down FM2, which I'm not really sure why it exists. But um, apparently, it was a request of someone years ago. and. I've tried to keep it maintained. That's the other thing. I won't guarantee that FM2 light works entirely because it has a separate set of build files from FM2 itself. And while I've tried to keep them synced since I never use it, I'm not sure they are. I haven't had any complaints though, so maybe. And then vtree and vdirectory, like I said, are more like the drives folder and where you have a single thing that is the drives tree and then when you click on it it opens a completely separate container that contains the so it, it's more like OS2 itself and one next slide okay um, <clears throat> it remembers basically anything you want it to remember um, if you want to if you have a directories that you always go to or that you always save to, those sorts of things, you can just simply put on a list so you can click on them. Um, search patterns, it remembers. In other words, I, it's already got a big list of those in it, which are just basically star dot something, star dot C, star dot H. So if you always want to search for certain types of things, you can save those. You can save the command lines that you use. Um, filtering for different, for the directory containers you can save. And lots of other things. So again, it's a very versatile program. Um, and it's one of the programs that I use every day. And last slide. Great, man. Thank you. Just asked a question about remap drives. It has the ability. I can I can set a drive letter to point to another drive letter, or a drive letter to point to a directory, so that it will just that it'll actually remap them internally, so that if I have an unused drive, for example, I can set that drive letter to some directory that I use commonly, and when I click on it in FM2, that's what I'll get. I understand, but I can't think of where in OS2 you can remap a drive except in the uh, doc. You, you can remap drives in a lot of places. Net, net drives does it. Yeah, the, but that makes virtual drives. Well, that's what this amounts to, only it's a virtual drive that's restricted to FM2. Okay, it's within FM2 itself. Yeah. So it's not a drive that you've remapped somewhere else. Right. In other words, what I've done is just stole the use of a drive letter that's not being used. <clears throat> Other questions? Well, thank you for your attention. <laughs>